So this time to start. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not entirely sure I'd call it exciting, but it's a topic. Um, so on the left board, uh, I have summarized what I said in the last lecture, which may one, you may wonder why it took me an hour and 45 minutes to say all this, uh, if I can fit it onto uh, three quarters of a board, but there it is. Uh, so I'm interested in looking at sets, which are sort of dynamically defined, and I want to know something about them. And uh, I've chosen to talk about sets generated in the simplest possible way. They're just going to be, in this case, a Cantor set sitting inside the unit interval. Uh, and they're defined in terms of an iterative function scheme. So in the picture, that just means I have a bunch of contractions. I've drawn two. In general, it'll be k, k greater than equal to 2. And there'll be a limit set. So the limit set is... Um, the uh, invariant set uh, under these maps, in whatever way you like to think of it. Um, but it's a Cantor set uh, associated to this uh, iterated function scheme. Uh, why am I working with the unit interval? Why am I working with just C2 maps? Here, it's easy. I'm, I'm a great uh, advocate of easy. The easy way is not always the best way, but in this occasion, it's the easiest way to try to communicate ideas. Uh, you can always try to generalize this to your favorite setting if you want to look at rational maps, if you want to look at uh, limit sets, Kleinian groups. Well, you just have to replace the interval by some other domain. You have to replace the contractions by some other contractions on the appropriate domain and then see if it works. Okay, so that's my setting and that's the set and I want to understand its dimension. Um, and this dimension has a nice complicated definition, which is hopeless for the purposes of computation. So we need something that works a bit better. And so what we can do instead is we can use the, uh, the Bowen formula. What does that mean? Well, it means that we have a, a pressure function like this. And the, where it crosses the, the axis, this nice uh, monotone decreasing function is going to be the dimension of a set x. Why is that? Because we set it up that way. Um, it's nice. So what's the pressure P? Well, P has a definition. You can define it in terms of um, the formal definition uh, of uh, Ruel, Walters, and these guys. Or you can use the variational principle, or you can do almost anything. Um, but for our purposes, the easiest way to think of it is in terms of this operator. So we have a linear operator acting on a Banach space. Banach space is C1 functions. Allowing me to do my usual joke about you've seen one function, you've seen them all. And the way it works is you take a function which is C1, and then you average it out over the images under the different uh, contractions. So for every point, you're going to get k points over here, hopefully, and you just average out with the weighting given by this. This is the derivative of the map raised to the power t. So it's actually a family of operators parameterized by t, which is good because we want a parameter t hanging around down here, whose name has not been mentioned. That's t. Okay, so I've got a family of operators. What do they do? Well, they're bounded linear operators uh, acting on my Banach space, and they have a spectral radius because they're a bounded operator. Uh, the spectral radius then is going to be e to the p of, of t. What's p of t? It's going to be the pressure. I can use this to characterize the pressure because that's how I'm going to use it, or I could say it's equivalent to the usual definition of pressure, blah, 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 without the blah, 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 blah at the end, of course. And here is my plot. Here's my uh, concept of the pressure. So how am I going to prove that the dimension is equal to whatever number I want to show it's equal to? But what I want to do is I want to show that the, uh, the dimension of x is bigger than some number called uh, t0 and smaller than some number t1, which I know. And it would be kind of nice if t0 and t1 were quite close. Otherwise, it's a bit useless. And so how do I prove that? Well, I want to use this simple lemma. What does a simple lemma say? Uh, it says I'm going to use this characterization of the pressure, and I'm going to use this Bowen formulation of a dimension to actually give me estimates. So in particular, the simple lemma says that if I take my lower bound, my prospective lower bound, t0, I want to show this is true. How am I going to do that? Well, I will take my, uh, I, uh, my transform operator, lt, where t is equal to t0, 
this is a t0 gain. And then what I want to do is I want to say, let's assume we can find a function f0 which is positive. Might happen. And if it does happen, I want, to, I want to have the property that it gets bigger. At every point, the function goes up. That's it. And the claim is, if that's true, then it's going to imply that p of t0 is, is bigger than 0, i.e. we have this picture. On the other hand, let's assume we take the value t1, t is equal to t1, uh, we look at the transfer operator associated to that, and let's assume that we can find a function called f1, different function, uh, with the property that when we apply the transfer operator, the function goes down. Every point, it takes a lower value than it did before. But the claim is that, in that case, the, the pressure at t1 is going to be less than or equal to zero. That is, we get this, this picture here. It goes down. So the dimension has to be between, because the picture is, is the pressure function is monotone decreasing, blah, 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 blah. Hello. Uh, a question about uh, Lt, transfer operator. Uh, if you consider it instead, uh, say, of the Hilbert space of uh, square integrable functions, yeah. uh, will, it give the same, will it have the same spectral radius? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the advantage of looking at more exotic spaces is you see more of the spectrum, but the spectrum you've already seen is still there. Usually that's the case. Yes. Um, uh, can I ask a... Oh, sorry, I missed you. Uh, you, put, you raised your hand, and like any, any bad teacher, I just ignored it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the relationship between um, F0 and T0 and F1 and T0? Um, okay, so at the moment they're just functions. I haven't, they're just hypotheses. Okay. Um, when I get around to actually finding them, there'll, there'll be some way to construct them. Uh, let, let me leave that a bit mysterious at the moment, right. and I may brush it under the carpet a bit anyway, but, but at the moment it's just an abstract result. And then of course the proof of this, anyone can do, it's easy. So here's the proof, and I'll do, I'll do one, and the proof is three lines. So the first observation is that the operator is positive. So we're looking at this bit is a positive operator. So when I say it's a positive operator, I'm not commenting on its, its, its views on life. It's not positive in that sense. It's positive in the sense that it maps positive functions to positive functions, i.e. functions which are above the line to functions which are above the line. So in particular, we're assuming that F0 is less than or equal to Lt0, F0, because I've just written it there in the picture. But if I apply the operator to this, then I get this guy is replaced by this guy, and this guy is replaced by LT. Oh, it became a pound sign. It's obviously, some sort of whoops, suggestive uh, comment. So it's a square F0. All I've done is to apply the operator to the original equation, and now I get that equation. And I just keep going. N times, N just being any number I fancy. So I'll get this is bigger than this. And what can I do now? Well, I can take roots. Which roots do I take? I can take the nth root. And so in particular, if I take the nth root of this side, then uh, I take uh, L to the n t0 f0. I take the norm. It doesn't really matter which norm I use. I'll take the supremum norm, because it's as good as any the spectral rate just being the same on, on C0 functions. And then I take the nth root of that. And these functions are all positive, so the left-hand side will be down here. So the left-hand side of this will just be um, F0, with no n involved, nth root. That's also the sub -norm. And then I take the uh, limit as n tends to infinity, of both of these guys, because I don't like n's very much. And this is just a fixed function, so this quantity here is going to be equal to 1. And the right-hand side, well, I told you that this was the uh, spectral radius of the operator. So, in fact, uh, this is just going to be equal to, let me write it underneath to make it symmetric. This is going to be equal to e to the p of t0. I'm presuming I've got my signs right, then this is just saying this. And then the proof of 2 is similar, except the inequality is going the other way. Proof of two similar. So it's the simplest uh, proof you could think of. Have you used strictly two sigma or is it maybe quite less than one? 
Um, I, I don't mind that if things are strictly increasing or not. This should be... Or all the inequalities, it's always safer to make them greater in equality because there's limits involved. Um, some of them don't have to be, but then I'm, I'm, I prefer to err on the side of caution. Question? Hello. So you say that L2 is positive. Is it positive uh, in the sense of operator theory? Yes, positive in that sense. It, it's mapping what would be the positive cone in the Banach space inside itself, and the positive cone here is those functions which take values in the real numbers which are greater than or equal to zero. Hello, how are you? Positive cone in C0, not C1, right? Uh, yes, in C0. You're quite correct. I'm just looking at the C0 things. I was getting a bit mixed up with trying to say exotic things about that experience. Well, let me just embarrass people for coming late. But you have a duty. If you try and make the circulation. They're left over from, from uh, the last section. And you have a duty to finish them. I'm not allowed to eat chocolate. This is why I give out chocolate. It's a sort of a proxy thing. I get other people to enjoy it, and then I enjoy it as, as a secondary effect. Okay, so, so that's, that's all there is to it. There's not much there, except I haven't told you how we choose T0 and T1, and I haven't told you how we choose F0 and F1. But I'll get around to that in a minute. While, while we're musing on that, this is um, uh, an example I wanted to talk about. So um, but those of us who are fortunate enough to go to Marius' talk yesterday, excellent talk, um, he was talking about computing values and things, and things like uh, digits and uh, of continued fractions and stuff. Um, but yesterday, uh, there came up this question about what happens in the case of examples of renormalization. So the only example I know uh, is to do with real case of renormalization. This is partly because I knew Oscar Lamsley quite well when I was younger. Um, and, and in that case, you have a unimodal map. This is meant to be my unimodal map, which I call G. I don't know why I called it G. It just seemed like a good idea. And uh, so it's, it's a map, in this case, from minus 1 to 1 into itself, but it's still unimodal. And it's meant to be symmetric, and it has a bunch of conditions. It's got to be analytic. It's got to have various other properties. But the most important thing is that it satisfies some fixed-point equation. So this is called the, the feigenbaum stitanovich um, a functional equation. I have to mention that because uh, I used to meet Sitanovich a lot in Georgia Tech and we used to have coffee together, so I've got to give him a plug. Um, okay, so uh, that's, that's the way to characterize this, this function, and so we just do the same thing as was described in the previous lectures, uh, which is we associate an attractor in some way. So let me, for convenience, just say we take the orbit of the, the, the zero, I think it's the right definition, take the closure. So maybe that's going to be the attractor, but it doesn't really matter. There's some set X, which is a Cantor set, which will have a certain Hausdorff dimension. Uh, this definition, like most definitions, is not overly helpful. You need a better definition, one that's going to help us. So what we really need is some sort of iterated function scheme. We need to have a, two contractions, which are nice, and then do what I did over here. And what we can do in this case is we can associate, uh, by the magic of reading uh, Kenneth's book, um, God bless Kenneth, um, an iterative function scheme. This is what it's meant to look like. So a point x is mapped onto two points t1 of x and t2 of x, and these maps are just defined in terms of properties of the function g by some, hopefully, uh, similar to this kind of uh, construction. But it's, it's fairly explicit. Um, and there's a plug here for Kenneth's book. This is not the book that's got the nice cover, which is used for students. It's an earlier book published in the Tracks in Mathematics uh, series, and then you can carry out this algorithm. And what happens is that you put it on your laptop and it gives you an answer. Whether this answer is useful for anything, I have no idea, it's just a number. Could be a lot, you could get more decimal places, you could get less, depending on how patient you are with the computer. So the algorithm just gives you this. Okay, so that's what I wanted to, to say about that. Would I, hello. Question, uh, you know, is it possible to do similar thing uh, for another combinatorics, say for Fibonacci combinatorics? Well, that, that would depend on a number of things. One is me understanding the, what it means to be Fibonacci combinatorics. So, so despite my, my pretenses, I don't know an awful lot about one-dimensional dynamics or even complex dynamics. So let me say it works whenever you can put it into this context. If you can get a bunch of contractions on some domain and you can apply this argument, you're in good shape. So um, apart from that, I can't say very much. Okay, 
Um, so what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so the only thing I haven't really told you is, is uh, how to construct the functions uh, f0 and f1 and how to choose the values t0 and t1. And, and it's actually very easy. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I would like to say something about the Atmoth exponents and that will require me getting there. So let me erase this stuff since it was just here for show, uh, not for any particular pedagogical uh, purpose, and try to make some comments about how we choose F0 and F1. And, uh, okay, so these are the practical problems, practical problems. Question. How do we prove, how do we choose T0 smaller than T1, and how do we choose F0 and F1? And so, let me do it uh, probably uh, one way around or the other. So let me start with the uh, first problem. So uh, one, let's say that we're given the values T0 and T1, I'll come back to them in a minute. Um, how do we choose um, F0 and F1? So F0 is associated to T0, F1 is associated to, to T1. So how do we choose them? Uh, well, what we do is use uh, a simple technique called co-location. So solution is use co-location. I'm not sure how many L's there are on co-location. Let me put two and then hope that it's kind of rightish. Uh, so the idea here is that we want to choose our functions F0 and, and F1. Well, we, we, we want to, they don't, it's not just one choice, we just want to choose some choice, we don't really care that much. Um, and we're going to choose them to be polynomials. And if we're going to choose polynomials, we have to choose the appropriate um, coefficient. So how does this work? Well, we fix some value of n, so let me just say fix uh, n0 greater than or equal to 2, it's a natural number large. And then what do I do with it? Well, then I look at polynomials, so uh, consider a bunch of polynomials, which are going to be Lagrange polynomials. And I will denote them by something. Maybe I'll denote them by P of n. So P of n. These Lagrange polynomials are going to be polynomials on the interval. So the nth polynomial, whoops, so this is where n is going to run from 0 to n. So what is, what is p of n? Well, it's going to be a polynomial of degree little n, p of n. And you might like to choose uh, x to the n as a good polynomial, but <clears throat> the, the Lagrange polynomials are chosen in such a way that they have a more natural orthogonality conditions. And I also want to choose a bunch of points, which are going to be the Chebyshev points. Uh, And these points are denoted by x of n. Again, there's going to be, uh, whoops, n plus one of them. And uh, the thing about these is that there's some orthogonality. So if you evaluate these guys at these points, it's going to be either going to be zero or one, depending on the indices. But more importantly, we then define a matrix. Uh, I've written in my notes n by n one matrix, but it's actually n plus one, I guess. So it's n plus 1 plus n plus 1 matrix. So it's a real matrix. How is it defined? I'll call it M for matrix. And it's entry R or S. So R and S are just the indices between 1 and, sorry, between 0 and n plus 1. And the reason that I'm using R and S is I just ran out of letters, I think. And so what do I do here? Well, what I do is I uh, take my uh, transfer operator, I take the value either T0 or T1, whichever I prefer, let me write Ti, so 1 or 2, is it 1 or 2, or 0 and 1? It's 0 or 1 in fact. And then I apply it, it's an operator with axon function, so I apply it to this matrix, which is P of n. 
So now I've got another function. And then I evaluate this at a point, and then I get a real number, except I should have put an R there, and it should be an X. So you do the only thing you can do with this information to get a number, you take the the uh, R uh, polynomial, you apply the operator, you do this, and you get a matrix, which is good. Have I missed anything out? Nope. Okay. Uh, and that's great. So it's a matrix, and then you look for its largest eigenvalue and its largest eigenvector. Our largest eigenvector here means the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue. So let um, V, V sounds a vector, so this is going to be V0 up to Vn plus 1, and B, B, uh, left, because in rows work for left, don't they? Left uh, eigenvector. associated to the maximal eigenvalue. <coughs> so uh, how do we know there's a maximal eigenvalue? Well, we don't actually, but if n is large enough, we know that there will be one by some sort of perturbation theory stuff. But in practice, we don't really care because we're just going to choose n to be some large number like 100. And then it will transpire that when we look at this, it will work. There'll be a left eigenvector associated to the largest eigenvalue. And then, what do we do then? We set uh, the function f of i, either f0 or f1, uh, at the point x. Well, it's just going to be the polynomial uh, n equals 0 to uh, n plus 1, where we use these coefficients from the matrix, and we multiply it by this basis of polynomials. And that's it. Then we stop. So we're just constructing a, a function, uh, either f0 or f1, according to what we want to do. And providing we've made lucky choices of, of, of t0 and t1, then it will have the right property. And this lemma will tell us that we have the right inequality. That's it. There is nothing more to it than that. Um, but you have to check that this function that you're constructing um, has the right properties, so you have to check that it's positive, because there's nothing here guaranteeing it's positive, you have to check that. And um, you also have to check that it satisfies the hypothesis um, and hypothesis. What happens if it doesn't? Well, then you just choose a bigger value of n and try again. Excuse me, uh, hi. Uh, where is i on the right hand side in the first line uh, uh, of the line? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, where is i? Uh, i, I is, is, is buried inside this, this polynomial, uh, sorry, inside these coefficients. So this, this eigenvector here was an eigenvector for this matrix, which I guess could should also morally have an i with it as well. Okay, thank you. I was trying to do both at the same time, always a fake on the same. Okay, and that's, that's it, that's how we do it. So, how, so, so let me just say, how do we choose the uh, T0 and T1? So, um, well, it's, uh, we use uh, a bisection method. So we live in the glorious days when I used to teach first year calculus in, in Warwick for many years. Um, we used to have this thing called lion hunting, which was when, which was actually just a bisection method. The idea was if you're going to trap a lion, uh, then uh, what you want to do is build a fence down the middle of its domain, on one side or the other, then you build another fence. How you get into build a fence was never clear to me, but you build a fence where you keep dividing the area where the lion is in um, until it's constrained to some very small area. And it's the same here. We take, um, we take our uh, original interval, which would just be 0, 1, and then we choose initially two values of t0 and uh, t1, so we might choose t0 here and t1 here, so that's the first choice. And uh, these will be particularly useless, but we know that the dimension where we're down there, if we know the dimension is bigger than 0 and smaller than 1, so it's going to work. And then we take the midpoint of that, and we look at the midpoint of that, and then we see what the pressure function looks like. 
And we want these values to either be above or below the line, so we just choose a sequence of points by taking midpoints where we determine whether or not the pressure is above or below the line at each step. So let me just say it's just an iterative process where we keep dividing the parameter space by a half. And it goes down exponentially fast. So the thing that I've just uh, erased, um, I, I, I ran on my laptop to work this thing out to 50 decimal places. So how did I do that? Um, well, I, I, what did I do? Good question. I got, I got it to use Mathematica. It was working to maybe 150 decimal places, because Mathematica likes that. Um, and what it did was it chose n to be something like 200, because that was enough. And then it wrote down these 200 by 200 matrices. And then it did it starting from these two values. And then it just iteratively did this. It did it for like 150 steps. And it took it a few hours. But by the end of that, it came up with the number you saw. Um, there's nothing in this mathematical proof which is real mathematics. It's just messing around. Hi. Great. So this bisection, you choose the midpoint, and then you do this. You find your function that's associated to. Yeah. So, so the midpoint. So if I take this, if I take this one to be zero, and I take this one to be one, then the midpoint is clearly just going to be half. <laughs> that was easy. And then what I do is I look at the value of. Uh, the pressure function at a half. How do I do that? Well, I have to estimate it using this, this lemma. I want to know whether it's going to be bigger or smaller than... than right. the... From half, you find a function, and then you see whether it... Yeah, so, 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 so in this case, let me think. So if it's zero, then presumably, in this case, we know that the pressure of T0 1 is positive. I think that's the right way around. And at this end, we know that it's, it's going to be negative, so the pressure of... Uh, T0 of, of uh, 1, so it's not a 0, it's a 1, this thing is going to be negative. So what we do is we look at the value in between, which is a half. Uh, so I should have just put 0, that would be more intelligent. <laughs> Sorry. And, and then we want to know what the value of this is, so P of half. Uh, I think we could probably make a strong guess based on this. So let's assume that it's going to be negative. So that what we do then is we just bump this guy. So if this guy is smaller than zero, then we just concentrate on this interval, where we now have a value which is positive or one that's negative. And we just keep doing it. So then we look at some midpoint of here, which is probably a quarter. And then if that value was, was, was positive, then we bump this guy and then just look at that interval. We just keep on looking at intervals where the endpoints have the property that the pressure is bigger than zero or smaller than zero. But is it possible that this function you construct will neither satisfy I or I, I in, in your simple it's, 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 it's theoretically possible that for a, thick, for, for a fixed value of n, that's certainly the case, it will happen. So you bump it up. But theoretically, theoretically means using mathematics, uh, what should happen is that for sufficiently large n, it will always work. Because the pressure is strictly convex. Uh, sorry, strictly monotone decreasing. So it works. It works in practice and it should work in principle. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, um, could you get a more efficient algorithm by looking at how positive it is and how negative it is, and instead of bisecting it, you choose a different point. Now, the short answer to, to whether I could do it is no. Um, can other people do it? I have no idea. I hadn't really thought about it. I, I, I don't go in for complicated algorithms. I just go in for things that work. Um, and then I move on. Uh, okay, so, so that was it. Hi. That wasn't it, no. Yeah, that's a stupid question. Um, oh, those are the best so, ones. I love those. Uh, just then can you just approximate the dimension by just using the pressure? You just check if it's positive or negative. Just keep narrowing down. Well, that's that's more or less what we're doing, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're we're trying to we're trying to find a value t for which the pressure is equal to zero. And all we're doing is we're, we're saying, well, at different values, it's, it's, it, um, uh, we have intervals which are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're all getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the property of these intervals is that one end, the pressure is, is bigger than zero, and the other end is smaller than zero. So I, I just got confused, like, why, why do we need to bother with the building the function? Well, the, pr the pressure is the only game in town. It's the only way we know how to get the dimension. No, no, but, but so why do we need the Oh, do you mean why do we need this? Yeah. yeah, because we, we need to find some simple way to show that the pressure is either positive or negative. And that's it. Oh. Uh, if you look at the, if you remember the definition, well, the, if you look at this, if you can find a, a better way to get the, the, um, the maximal eigenvalue out, it's fine. 
Um, you can you could just say, well, it's an operator. We could always approximate it by a matrix, but you've got to do something rigorous, unfortunately. This this co-collation method is very classical in numerical analysis, but it doesn't give you any error, error estimates. Whereas this kind of trivial argument gives you something which is rock solid, or at least convincing. Ish. Okay. How are we doing for time? That's fine. Okay. So so let me not say any more about that because you know. It's in my notes anyway, if you want to, you want to read them online. Uh, what I wanted to do was uh, to devote the, the balance of the time uh, to talking about the Aptoff exponents. Um, so the Aptoff exponents are a very, very similar story. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's the flip side of, of the game. So um, I'm going to erase. Uh, let me leave the... Uh, summary of and get rid of this bit for the moment. <coughs> um, yeah, so there's lots of things in, in mathematics uh, where you do one thing and it's useful and then it applies to something else. So I spent, I spent part of my youth looking at uh, dynamical zeta functions and it turned out to be useful for studying correlation functions. So they're kind of, you know, parallel stories, but it's the same machine, it's the same story here. So for the output of exponents, everything I've just told you can be applied in some context. Uh, to prove some results. There you are. That sounds kind of vague, doesn't it? Um, so what I'm going to talk about. So now I want to talk about the Athenoff exponents. And I'm going to put a large Roman numeral 2 at the beginning. And we said that I put one at the beginning of a dimension theory stuff, which I probably didn't. So this is about the Athenoff exponents. And then the first question is, what do I mean by the Athenoff exponents? Uh, well, I want to talk about two different settings. We'll probably run me out of time. Uh, so, so one one context is to look at maps, and in the same spirit that I looked at interval maps here, I'm going to look at interval maps somewhere else. So I could be looking at uh, maps of the interval. Uh, and in this case, uh, absolutely continuous measures. For example, could be something else, but let's say it's that. Or, or alternatively, uh, we could look at random products of matrices. Or we could look at more things, but let's for the moment restrict ourselves to these two different uh, pictures. Um, uh, what we could be looking at. And let me say a bit about the first one. And then I will say something about the second one. So the, the approach actually turns out to be rather similar. But let me start off by talking about the first one. So this is going to be um, the Atomoff exponents. exponents. For, they're actually going to be, uh, just, say, just say, expanding maps to the interval. Again, I'm not going to work in great generality because I think that might obscure the simplicity of everything. So uh, let me just say that I'm going to take a map t from uh, 0 and 1 to itself. I have a favorite interval, it's 0, 1. Uh, it's going to be uh, a C2 expanding, to fail, expanding uh, Markov. Well, let me write Markov. Bernoulli, and I'll draw a picture to explain what I mean, uh, map. Uh, so in particular, it means that, uh, I'm going to draw a picture here in fact. So here's the interval 0, 1, and I'm going to divide it up into a number of pieces. Uh, the endpoints of these intervals are going to be uh, x0, x1, x something, up to x n minus 1, no, x n, and then 1 is just going to be x n plus 1. And I'm drawing a graph of the picture, so here is 0 up to 1. And then uh, if it's Markov, then intervals should go to intervals. I can move this over a bit so it looks a bit more convincing as x2. But I'm going to assume, in fact, that they're full branches. I don't need to do this, but somehow it's going to make the uh, definitions a bit simpler. 
Um, so I'm going to assume that my map, whatever it is, has the property that these derivatives are going to be bigger than one. Okay, so let me write that down. So here, IE, IE, uh, there exists um, x0 is equal to 0, smaller than x1 is smaller than up to xn, uh, smaller than xn plus 1 is equal to 1, i.e. just this partition of the interval, it's meant to be a 0, because that's essentially the Greek letter. Um, and then I want to assume that uh, t restricted to the associated intervals. I'll write it as square, which is probably a bad thing to do, but I'm beyond such things. So I'll assume this is c2. I'll also assume that um, it's expanding, so there exists some beta greater than 1, such that something is true, such that the derivative of the map at every point is a point x. Uh, the slope of the graph is going to be greater than equal to beta. That's going to be for all x, where, let's say in this joint union, i, x, i, I just want, presumably if I'm right, I'm right in the corner, nobody can read it, so I can write anything I want down there. It'll be hidden forever. And it's, I, I know in this picture, I just assume that not only is it Bernoulli, but it's actually, uh, sorry, not only is it Markov, but it's Bernoulli in the sense that uh, the image of the, the intervals uh, xi, xi plus 1 is the entire thing. That just simplifies the definition of a transfer operator when it comes along. That's the only reason I've done it. And it's also because I can then look at functions on the original interval, not on these disjoint unions, which would make my life slightly harder. So there's a classical theorem, which in this case, I'm not sure who it's due to, but let me make just say Lasotta and uh, York. And uh, what did they say? Uh, well, there exists an absolutely, there exists an absolutely continuous, absolutely. Continuous, uh, a godic um, t invariant probability, which probably has a name, uh, which is Greek, probably in this case. Uh, I'm looking around, what did I call it? Mu. So let me, yeah, so it's called it mu, and so absolutely continuous just means that uh, d mu uh, d, d, dx. With respect to the Bayek measure, it's going to be some, some I guess, L1 function. Uh, but in this particular case, it's actually going to be C1. So, let me just say that, C1. I think they don't I, assume Markov, which may be this. No, they, 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 yeah, they, they, they don't assume Markov. And I assume there was a precursor to that where somebody assumed Markov and proved it, but I don't know who that person was. But, yeah. Uh, this is the book by Fonin and Sinaconta, I think, very, I think by mistake, assuming the proof it is Markov, not well, assuming the theory. There's, there's a very entertaining article, uh, another posthumous article by Rufus Bowen, uh, and it has a, because um, he was dead, there was a, there was a, a, a sort of um, extra bit tacked on at the end by Roy Adler, who goes into great detail about the history of these things. And then tacked onto the end of that, there's some comments by Caroline Series. So it's a bit, it's a bit uh, interesting, some history of these things, but I don't know it. Let me just confess my ignorance. I just say that the statement is true. And, you know, so I saw Jimmy York last year, he looks in good health, so I say, let's give him a plug. Um, that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, this is just an abstract thing, but of course, um, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. And so, let me just say one. I'm sure everybody has their favorite example. If it's the doubling map, it's not going to be very interesting. So let me just say one other example. And let me keep an eye on the clock as well. So here is an example. An example of what? An example of a map that satisfies these conditions. And it's a popular one. And it's the Atlantic map. And the Lampard map is just a map from 0, 1 to uh, 0, 1, the closed interval to itself. And the way it's defined is it looks a bit like the doubling map. So it's x goes to 2x mod 1. But then in a nod to people who like unimodal maps, 
you add in one half x, one minus x. So it's, it goes sl the graph goes slightly above the usual straight lines that you get in the doubling map. And then in particular, it satisfies all those conditions. And if I do a lightning calculation, which I prepared earlier, then the derivative of this map, I don't need to take absolute values, but it doesn't matter, is bigger than 3 over 2, which is bigger than 1. There you go. Advanced mathematics. OK. And so in particular, it satisfies this hypothesis, so it's an example. And what is for the Apanoff exponent? Well, given my highly exciting uh, expanding map, well, which is a bit simple, but that's fine, um, we can define the Apanoff exponent, so we can associate to the map, and thus to the measure mu, which is unique in this particular case, uh, so to c and mu. Uh, the uh, the Apanoff exponent, which is a single number, <clears throat> and what it is is I've called it uh, lambda t and mu, and in this case it's nothing other than the integral over the interval zero one of the log of the derivative of x d mu of x. That's it. It's a number. And so by the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, if we take any point in the interval, typical with respect to this uh, nice measure mu, then the average of the log of the derivative will converge to this. But then the average of the log of the derivative is just measuring the expansion along the orbit. So morally, if you have moral things in mathematics, uh, morally it's just measuring the instability along the orbit. That's the way to think of these things. Oh, it's the way I think of these things. It's not quite the same thing. Please. My interesting question is in CR. Yeah. You lose one, lose less, yep. and, and, and the proof is more the standard. But yep. if you don't want to lose, it is in dimension one on interval. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I think Krzyzewski and other people. Mm -hmm. And nice proofs are in the book by Abraham Boyarski and Pavel Gura. Yeah. But in higher dimension for expanding to get CR, I think it is open. Okay. That sounds like an interesting so problem. Krzyzewski claims he could prove it, but the proof works on the dimension of one. Yeah, I mean, not losing. Nice theory. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not losing differentiability is always nice. I mean, in, in, in the obvious proof, you show that the density is a fixed point for the transfer operator, but that involves differentiating because these transfer operators always involve some derivatives, and so you have to get around that. Which is Can kind you of nice. prove it? Oh, very, very nice. Uh, so let me let me uh, do the following. I wanted to advertise I think that's an excellent idea. So uh, let me uh, just write down some. We're heading towards a break at some stage, I guess. I forget when the break is on. So let, let me let me just write down some more mathematics, um, and then then we can have a break, and then I can pick it up afterwards. Uh, I just like to write something that gets us in the direction of saying something about this uh, this this guy. So, when we wanted to work out the Hausdorff dimension of a set, which was defined by an iterated function scheme, then the pressure was kind of useful. Um, and so what we want to do now is associate another pressure function. And so, uh, so let me just write at the top problem. How to estimate Lambda t mu. Again, it's another number where it's a bit unlikely that in, in a given example we can actually figure out what it is. It won't have an expression across form. We have to grind out some number which approximates it if we really care. And um, we use the uh, corresponding pressure. So I've already defined the pressure in the standard way for an iterated function scheme, and so there's just going to be a definition for an expanding map, which actually is not very different, so it's going to be the following. So given a value t in the real line, it's going to be given by a parameter. Uh, we define 
the uh, pressure P of T just to be, well, it's more or less what you think, the limit as n tends to infinity of 1 over n log of, and then we sum up something. So before we summed up over all the pre-images we could get by choosing different branches, so here we do it differently. So let's say we sum up over periodic points for the map, because we only have one map. Let's do that. Um, or we could actually do something more intelligent than having written this down. Uh, we could look at all the pre-images of, say, some point. So we sum up over all those x, uh, so it's for t to the n of x is equal to zero. Uh, zero being a point in my interval. So my, my slight obsession with periodic points is creeping in there. It's not necessary to do that. And then what we do is we, we want to have some expansion, so we look at the map. But now it's an expanding map, so when we look at the derivative at the point x, which is the pre-image under t to the n, that's the nth iterator of the map, then I want to raise this to the minus t, this is where the minus sign comes in. And then I have to put the brackets, because it's nice to put brackets when you put logs. Uh, so that's, that's going to be my definition of the pressure. And this will have a corresponding uh, picture, which I think I will put uh, over here. And then before, when we were talking about the Hausdorff dimension and trying to, uh, 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 some limit set and trying to write it in terms of the, um, the pressure function there, then we're looking for a value where it's equal to zero. But here we don't do that because it's not the appropriate thing to do. Uh, what we do is something else. So we want to say something about this pressure function and then uh, do something. So let me draw the picture here and write some stuff here. So uh, let me just say propative. Uh, so the first one is that uh, P of zero is equal to uh, something, one, zero, one, the wrong way around. P of one is equal to zero. So if I take this to be a one, it's equal to zero. So here's, here's my plot of my function. And let me see if I can draw it in some reasonable way. So the pressure function for the iterated function scheme, which served us so well in the past, uh, has now been replaced by another pressure function. Perhaps one which is more familiar to most people anyway. So that's going to be uh, t. And the first observation is that when t is equal to 1, then it takes the value 0. And that's just some calculation stuff. Uh, another nice property is that I've drawn a nice smooth curve. And that's because it's a nice smooth curve. So uh, t goes to uh, p of t is uh, analytic. So it's uh, c infinity, even real analytic. And it might be convex. Or it might be concave, because I can never remember which one is which. But it curves like that. And then it's expanding, it's worth expanding assumption. Yeah, I'm assuming everything uh, in that picture. Nothing, nothing else is being assumed. You had a question. So is it a good interpretation of the first point, the fact that if you take the IFS corresponding to the inverse branches of this, that it will be the same pressure function and the interval will be the attractor? That would certainly be an interpretation. Okay. Um, I, I would just naively think in terms of operators, but uh, that's just my way of thinking. Idiosyncrasies. But that's, that's a very valid point. Uh, secondly, uh, so where is the Lyapunov exponent from the map going to make an appearance? Well, what you can say is that the Lyapunov exponent can be read off from the picture, and it's going to be equal to minus the derivative of my function t, uh, dt, at the value t is equal to 1. So if I draw a tangent line here, with some color that might be invisible, uh, and I put the minus sign in, so this tangent here should be uh, negative because it's going down, but the slope will be equal to minus the uh, Lyapunov exponent of this guy. So again, if I know the pressure function or know something about it, then I can hope to get some, some information. And so uh, the third observation, which I can't quite fit in because I haven't left enough room, but it's going to appear over here, is I'm going to exploit the fact that it's analytic, it's convex, and it's decreasing to say that, in particular, if I choose any epsilon greater than zero, i.e. small, because epsilons are always small, and I wanted to estimate this value, which is going to be minus the uh, derivative of the by t at the value of t is equal to 1, which is what I want to compute because it's equal to the Lyapunov exponent. So this is still the same as like lambda t and mu or mu and t, t and mu. 
then it's going to be, would you believe, less than or equal to pressure 1 minus epsilon over epsilon, and it's going to be greater than, commoner, it's going to be greater than minus uh, 1 plus uh, epsilon over epsilon. And why is that? Well, it would look slightly better if I drawn a better graph, but never mind. Uh, so this is the value of uh, 1. This is going to be the value 1 plus epsilon. Uh, this is going to be the value 1 minus epsilon. And so if I look at the value of my yellow line, which is the pressure, then this value here is going to be, well, the distance will be the absolute value of the pressure of 1 plus epsilon. And this distance here is going to be uh, epsilon. And this distance here is going to be uh, epsilon, and the value of something on the other line, I guess, is going to be uh, pressure of 1 minus epsilon. So if you compare the ratio of these guys and the slopes, then with some luck, you get this inequality. So what does that tell us? It tells us, again, if we could compute this pressure for a given value of epsilon, which we knew, um, then we can get an estimate on the Alpov experiment. And that's what we do. And how do we do it? We, we just use a similar method to the method we said before. So why don't we take a break, and um, then I will um, say a bit more about the proof, which is essentially what you think it's going to be. Um, and uh, then I'll try to squeeze in something about random matrix products. Okay, we'll do you in 10 minutes? Sure.